Season 4 of the On The Way podcast focused on the fruit of the Spirit that Paul lists in Galatians 5, 22, and 23. If you missed any of those episodes, you can find them at baptiststandard.com forward slash podcasts or on Apple, Google, Spotify, or Stitcher, or on our app, which is available in the Apple and Android app stores. Today, we have a special episode of On The Way, an interview with Fernando Ortega, a nationally acclaimed Christian recording artist that I've known since I was a young boy. In honor of the Christmas holiday, we spend most of our time talking about family. We have with us today Fernando Ortega. This is a real treat. Uh, Fernando and I have known each other for quite a while. Uh, We don't hang out all the time like we used to, um, which is, I don't know, maybe good or bad for each of us. But at any rate, Fernando, we are so glad that you are with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, you bet. And for those who don't know, and I can't imagine that there's anybody who doesn't know, uh, Fernando Ortega is a recording artist. He has uh, about 21 uh, albums to his credit. Yeah, that's incredible. So I think of the 21, two of those are EPs. So they're six six songs instead of a full album. Well, you know, sometimes it's harder to to cut it down than to... And what's interesting is now people are doing, uh, it's just always a single, a new single. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which I, I I like because I can finish a song and then turn it in and then go on to the next thing. But I yeah. I really miss the idea of doing a full record, you know? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because with a full record, you have a story arc, like your your latest one uh, with The Passion of the Christ. Crucifixion of Jesus. Crucifixion and, of Jesus, yeah. Yeah, and that was designed to be, that was going to be a, a whole series of records. Like I was going to do okay. Crucifixion, then I was going to go back and do Advent, uh, Christmas, Epiphany, or Advent, Birth of Christ, Epiphany, then Lent, and then Crucifixion, Resurrection, uh, Pentecost, you know, and all those things. It's like the Sufjan Stevens when he was going to do all the 50 states. Oh, yeah. And he did like three, and then that was the end of that whole thing. I, feel- I, I guess you get tired at a certain point. Yeah, well, yeah, but I only did <laughs> one record. I, <laughs> I, should, I should at least do Resurrection so that... People know that I actually believe that Christ rose from the dead, you know. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I'm going to start there, actually, um, because one of the things that we, we talked about in a written interview that we did of you, and we'll have the link to that uh, in the, the podcast information, uh, but you've served as a worship leader in eight different churches, uh, which right. is pretty incredible. And uh, the thing about that, one of the things that's incredible about that, uh, a lot of worship leaders... Uh, will serve in one denomination, maybe several churches, but in one denomination. Yeah. And uh, you've served in Baptist, Congregational, Episcopal, Anglican, Presbyterian. Evangelical Free, Presbyterian. What yeah. else? Uh, what are you? Oh, Pentecostal. But I wasn't, you know, in, in a couple of those churches, I wasn't the guy, but I was a guy who led worship here and there. Yeah. So my and, first... And those are very different, not, not just... Um, denominations and theologies, but like styles of worship to go, I mean, for example, Pentecostal to Episcopal, I mean, how different can you get? Yeah. So, and luckily I didn't have those back to back, although there are, <laughs> there are plenty of um, charismatic Anglican churches popping sure. around. I, yeah. I meet a lot of those people on the road and, you know, yeah. and it's interesting uh, having kind of, it's kind of vineyardy, but then, then you've got the, you know, the mass, you've got the the liturgy that that they follow and so it's it's interesting yeah but pentecostalism was a weird one for me i think the church that i was in was so uh it was it was pretty out there even for a pentecostal church some of the stuff that they taught was (laughs) (laughs) yeah well all right but you know i learned how to i learned how to improvise on the piano in that church because before i was just Mm. like i think i was 17 when i started playing there and I, I knew, you know, I played classical music, I read notes, but I didn't really know how to just, you know, cut loose on a chord yeah. progression. So I would stand up on the stage and the bass player, a guy named Doug, would stand next to me and he would just yell out, G, da, 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 C, da, and I kind of would like, I would just go, oompa, 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 you know, I would just play these chords. And then, you know, from there I started to loosen up a little bit and play scales or arpeggios and you know that's just how i learned yeah it's like jazz 
a little bit like jazz, not nearly as sophisticated, mm. um, but but yeah, similar. Yeah, yeah. Definitely a little more freewheeling than like high church liturgical Presbyterian or Episcopal worship. Yeah, very much so. When I finally became a, a Episcopal worship leader was here in town at um, St. Mark's on the Mesa Episcopal Church. And uh, the rector there, he was very, he was very formal. And, mm. and so I was so nervous that the, the church organist would sit in a chair and just tell me what to do next. Because, you know, and you don't, and I, one thing I loved about that was that this is the first time I was leading worship from behind the congregation in the balcony. Mm, yeah. Okay. If where the, the choir is. Where the choir is. Yeah. Yeah. And the organ was all, was back there. Everything was back there. So if somebody wanted to see who I was, they'd have to like turn around and crane their neck and look over the, you know, the railing of the balcony. But I like the idea that, you know, there's not this personality up front and they're not relying on, on like cues from you or, mm. you know, your smile, all those things play into a, a worship leader, like your demeanor, yeah. everything. I, my job was just to sing. When it came time to sing, I didn't talk, you know, I just sang. So, uh, or led, you know what I mean? It, yeah. I liked that a lot. I missed that. Do mm. you see yourself doing that again? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, we, <laughs> you don't miss it that much. <laughs> I, you know, I, after this last church, um, worship leading position I had, it, it, yeah. it can just get so political. Churches uh, can be so political. And I'm, and it, some of the stuff has been really, um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's really caused a lot of anxiety when stuff happens that, that just mm. doesn't seem motivated by, by, um, you know, gospel teaching or motivated by, by following Christ. It's just, it's just political stuff. It's power yeah. plays and stuff. And that, that, you know, I think that's just inherent in a small church or in a big church. There's always going to be that for me. I just, and for me, and, if, and maybe for just now, I think I want to stay away from being on a church staff and then just attend, attend church for a while. Cause I, I really haven't done it in for decades, you know? Yeah. 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 It, well, there are seasons, yeah, and and you have to sort of step away and and allow yourself to be ministered to. Yeah, the, the, I think there's partly that, and and uh, and then just getting tired tired from from. Uh, I, I think those things kind of erode after a while. You erode at your, I call them soft erosions of your faith. You know, when they when they mm. kind of pile up and everything. But yeah. So the, the last experience I had was a little bit, was, was, was very difficult for me. I got you. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, w one of the things that we were uh, exploring in the written interview is your family heritage. And we didn't get to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, so I'm wondering about, you know, one of the things you have mentioned to me is some genealogical work that you've recently started yeah. and some of the things that you're, you're finding out about your family and, and you say a little bit about that in the written interview. Yeah. I'd like to hear more about uh, some of that because it's exciting to me and it's exciting to you. Yeah, it began because uh, Ruby had requested a DNA, one of those DNA tests for, for Christmas or her birthday, which they are in this, her birthday's in December. Ruby's my daughter. Yes. So, so we got it last year and it was interesting. It was, I told her, you know, because this little portion that came up that said, you know, the, I forgot, how, I, I forgot how it worked. If I had it on, if I could look at it right now, I could explain it better, but that somewhere in, in her bloodline, it showed that she was like 60 more, 60% 60 more directed from Neanderthals than uh, the, everybody else who had taken the test. And so I said, that really <laughs> makes sense how your, of how your room looks and how you keep the bathroom and stuff. But she's anyway, going to appreciate you sharing that with the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why they put that in there, but so there was interesting stuff that came up, but also just faces started popping up, um, huh. uh, saying this person is a relative from this town. Uh, and there are people that I, I didn't know who they are. So uh, maybe a couple of them were, seemed like distant cousins that I, Oh, I remember meeting that person. But so I started, I decided to do a family tree. And so okay. that was a whole different website and, and, um, 
and so I, I've built quite, I've, I found a lot. It took me several months uh, to get to the point where I am. And now I've just kind of taken a break from it. But yeah, so, you know, the Ortegas, um, the first Ortega that I'm descended from uh, came to Albuquerque from Mexico uh, and, and uh, lived somewhere close to where I live now, the North Valley of Albuquerque. Wow. And he was born here in 1614. And, and then he died in, in, I think, Juarez, Mexico. So he went oh, back wow. to, to okay. Mexico. His wife stayed here. And then they, there were more children and they ended up moving up north to like the Santa Cruz area. I point that way because that's yeah. right, right here. <laughs> it's <but just> north <laughs> for you, yeah. That's north right now, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so then I was just able to look at those different families. And, and I think this first guy, I wish, I, I can't remember his name. I, I, I had it memorized a couple of weeks ago. But anyway, um, he had, you know, four kids, I think three daughters and one boy. And that one boy had a kid named Geronimo, Geronimo, who died at the age of 23 and he had only mm -hmm. one child but the child of Ger geronimo the son of geronimo had 18 kids so That's that incredible. kind of it was incredible yeah same wife and then and then you have to go back and look at different sources and you and it's just to make sure that you're, you're seeing the right information so there's 18 kids and then then later on down the line a few generations later somebody else had 18 kids and then um my great great grandfather uh had uh 16 kids so anyway there's a lot of ortegas wandering around yeah um, that's a big family tree yeah and it was so much weird and, some, and then you do actually see instances of like first cousins uh marrying each other and stuff which might explain why i had this toe growing out of the back of my neck <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> <laughs> anyway uh. anyway so it's, it's just been so interesting to see all these all these uh names you know and, yeah but I, now i have to go down and research each kid because from those kids many of them had multi you know huge families 11 kids 12 kids it's going to take forever to really get to the bottom of it all yeah i mean that's uh you won't have time to go back into music ministry yeah it's just yeah. maybe yeah. genealogy from here on out yeah there you go we'll be right back after a 15 second sponsor break since 1952 South Texas Children's Home Ministries has focused on healing hearts and sharing hope. Their nine ministries focus on helping hurting children and families, all regardless of an individual's ability to pay. To find out more, visit www.stchm.org. Well, at some point, your family became uh, fairly accomplished, I would say pretty accomplished musicians. Uh, I know that your, your mom uh, played accordion, yeah. Uh, you know, you play the piano and accordion. Uh, what other instruments does your family play? And how long has music been a part of your family? So on my dad's side, my grandfather was, was uh, my grandfather Juan Melquiades in Chimayo. Yes. That's, that's again, that's in, north. Yes, yeah, in north. Uh -huh. And he, he was uh, a singer. And there, I even found in the archives at UNM, uh, there are recordings of my grandfather singing as a young man. Oh, wow. uh, showing this guy, he, he was kind of like, who's the guy that the, the guy from from PBS who goes around and does all? Oh, the Ken things. Burns. Yeah, he was like a, a, a New Mexico's version of Ken Burns. His name was okay. uh, Donald J John John Donald Robb was his name R O B B, and he has this book where he just went around finding, um, you know, the, the different uh, song singers and musicians from around New Mexico, and he he spent a couple of uh, days with my grandfather recorded him singing you know different folk songs that are oh, wow. you know lost now yeah that's a treasure but, yeah yeah so so grandpa was a singer uh and i don't know beyond that you know earlier than him who was who was a musician but so he passed down that to his kids and my dad had a very sweet voice a kind of a, a medium tenor voice hmm. and and he could harmonize and he loved singing he played the the harmonica um, okay and then my mom played, she was from Mora, which is also it's, north, but more like over there. But anyway, more she- More northeast, yeah. Yeah, hey, uh -huh. good for you. Yeah. Um, and she um, she learned to play the button accordion. She got it from, from uh, I think one of her aunts gave, gave her the accordion. And um, 
So, and I don't know how, I play the accordion, but I don't play the button accordion. I just play the, the one with the, you know what I mean, the regular keyboard keys. Um, but she was, she was pretty good. I mean, um, she learned how to play, the, there's the chord, chords on this side, you know, and then she could just, the, the keys, like if you go out, the, it plays one note, then you go in, it plays another note. Um, and I never could figure that out. Never had the patience to anyway. <laughs> but but she played all kinds of stuff, you know. Mm. And, and it was just sweet. We have a lot of a lot of videos of her that that we took over the years. Yeah. So and th but then because of their music, you know, and the, the way they loved music, we we sang a lot in the car and we drove all over ah. the state. We really, Dad took us fishing. You know, during the summer we we were all over the place, lakes and streams in the yeah. nether regions of New Mexico. But we would just, in the car, sing. And it was, the songs we did were just weird, like, um, I've been working on the railroad all the live long. And we'd all have harmonies, you know. Yeah. It was like a serious Presbyterian, uh, yeah. It was fun. Yeah. You made these uh, songs sacred? We did. We, yeah, we would pray before and after we sang. Uh, you know. <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course. Low, yeah, yeah. Nine of winter low. Yeah, it's, it's it's those are really those are really fun times. And mm. uh, so my brother. Okay, so we moved to Ecuador when I was uh, eleven years old, and I was already playing the piano at that point. Which my is for those who are are not familiar with the globe, that's south of Mexico. That's right. That's yes. That okay. Way. Okay. You, through Mexico, Central America. Colombia is it Colombia that's on top Venezuela no Colombia yes. then Ecuador yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we lived there and and um I found a piano teacher right away uh this mm -hmm. guy he was an Ecuadorian guy spoke no English and I was just learning Spanish at that point I remember they used to smoke these cheap cigars during my lesson <laughs> and uh, like you know he'd tell me some something to do and then he'd go to the wall and go <laughs> and um and it was just kind of nasty this guy so we fired him and got a nice missionary lady from the from somewhere in indiana or something and and she just smoked the little cigarettes right cloves yeah she was a cloves she also chewed tobacco but yeah. okay but she didn't have that <laughs> hacking cough no <laughs> <laughs> so that made her better anyway um so she taught me a lot marie davis was her name and then my brother picked up classical guitar and he just blossomed on that thing so my brother now makes his living at music as well though he's hmm. he doesn't like to travel so he stays around here mostly and when you're good enough you don't have to travel right that's right that's is that I what he tells you the, yeah <laughs> <laughs> and that's why i travel all the time so. yeah, yeah yeah oh so. boy we'll be right back after this short sponsor break High Ground Advisors has a 90-year history of providing investment management and planned giving solutions to churches, faith-based organizations, and charitably-minded individuals dedicated to transforming lives. High Ground is trusted by over 450 nonprofit clients, and we're one of them. High Ground has partnered with Baptist Standard for over 70 years by offering a comprehensive charitable giving and investment solutions model, which includes asset management, planned giving education and development, account support services, real estate and minerals management, and expert legal consultation. High Ground and the Baptist Standard share similar values, such as serving those who are called and dedicated to transforming lives and being a trusted caretaker of legacies. They also value good stewardship, helping those who desire to be good stewards of their financial resources to find creative giving solutions to fulfill that calling we trust High Ground and consider them a loyal partner because they deliver the performance results we depend on to grow our mission. With nearly a century dedicated to the nonprofit sector and as a nonprofit themselves, they understand the needs and challenges specific to us. They give us the opportunity to work with people who share our faith and values. They come alongside our mission in ways that other investment management firms can't. They know that what they do to protect, strengthen, and grow our mission is ultimately in service to the gospel. To learn more about how High Ground can partner with you or your organization, visit their website at highgroundadvisors.org. So tell me something about the accordion. I'm interested in that because it's not an instrument that just anybody takes up and plays. It seems like one of those things that you either appreciate or you don't. 
Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of accordion jokes, just sort of like banjo jokes, you know. Um, I, I, I just, I don't know enough about it really to to mm. talk very intelligently about it. I, I met this producer out in out in L.A. when I was living out there. I lived out there for twenty two years. John Schreiner, he he produced mm -hmm. yeah. most of my records that I've done, and we co wrote so many songs together. And um, he just said, hey, we should put accordion on this song. And, I, and then, then watching him do it, I thought, wow, that's just cool. And I, I went and got one for myself at a secondhand store. I think I have five accordions right now out in the back uh, in, in this <laughs> okay. uh, storage room in the back. But I love the sound of it. I, I find it very charming and, and warm and, and folksy. Mm -hmm. And, and um, it just, once we added it to my records, it just had a, it, every time every record I did subsequently had accordion in it. You know? Yeah, we liked the sound of like doubling. A lot of times you hear Irish music where they double, where the accordion and the and the fiddle will double the line. They'll play these yes. lightning fast runs, and it has this certain sound that comes out. So, you know, I like that a lot. We we've we've, we've used that a lot on my records. Yeah, I would say it adds a quality to your music that is distinctly yours. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think it's an identifier uh, for your music in a, in a lot of ways. Huh. I played it in all the shows, um, you know, when I was traveling with the band. Now it's harder because it's usually just me at the piano and a cellist. Um, huh. And so it's harder to introduce according to the accordion to that mix. Plus, well, it's a, and if you yeah. wear it around, you know, your chest while you're sitting at the piano, it kind of gets in the way. I can do it, though. You I, can. I, yeah, okay. I think I've even done stuff where I was somehow playing left hand uh, bass notes and then playing the accordion and somehow rigging it. I've done some weird, like a circus <laughs> monkey, you know? I've even had like a, a djembe uh, here, uh, okay. a drum, and then hit the drum while I was playing the piano and using the pedal. It was weird. Um, yeah, you have to get resourceful when, when there's a low budget on the music uh, for, for the music ministry, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's right, that's right. Uh, going back to your family, yeah. uh, one of the things I'm I'm interested in, curious about, is uh, different families and even different cultures. Um, there there tends to be one side of the family that's dominant. Um, sort of the the culture of that side of the family carries through, or um, maybe it's just a cultural thing, like a family is patrilineal versus matrilineal. You know, the the dad it, things come through the dad, or versus things coming through the mom. Uh, for your family, uh, because I know Ortega uh, has a, a particular heritage, uh, which side of your family holds more sway, your mom's side or your dad's side? This is a really hard question for me because I would say, you know, my dad, people, when they, when I talk about my, my family and my life and my music, yeah. I constantly tend to talk about Chimayo, which is where my dad was from. Yes. And, and the lineage there, I tra this is the one that I trace back to 1614. Um, my mom's, when I was doing the family tree, this was interesting because there was su such a wealth of information on the Ortegas in, in northern New Mexico, um, in Chimayo area, Santa Cruz area. I, it was very easy to find stuff. My mom, I kept just hitting dead ends, dead ends. Hmm. In fact, um, she didn't she never knew her own grandparents and oh, wow and her mom um was not on friendly terms with them at all so she never spoke about them so my mom died she died, my mom died in may of 2020 uh saying she never knew who her grandparents were and kind of lamenting that wow. and then yeah and then after that is when i did the family tree and i found these people and i even found her great grandparents wow uh, in santa fe but it it ends there and the records are vague, you know, I can't find out like who had how many children. I just find like a name, you know? Um, yeah. So, um, but uh, that being said, my mom was, I, I always describe her and all of us feel this way that she was the sun in the Ortega solar system. Hmm. She, she was a powerful person. Yeah. Um, and my dad too, a very, you know, my dad was very, highly educated man with a very you know, amazing academic career not not academic career but he was a professor but i mean 
he he had a few degrees and and he he had more in like a, di a diplomatic career really um but my mom my mom was a, a strong person yeah. so they they had their influences in very different ways i would say yeah the the reason i think that i asked that question uh, you and i've talked before about how for me your music always takes me home yeah i grew up in albuquerque and that's where we first met each other um and so knowing how much Northern New Mexico is a part of who you are and, and even is a part of your music. Uh, and so when I think about home, I, I think about my parents and they still live in Albuquerque, but uh, it just, um, you, you can't think about home without thinking about the family ties and yeah. the influence that family has on who you are and what you do and why you do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Um, and, and then, you know, I'd say music from both sides, like I said, you know, and then when my parents, they, my parents met in junior high school in Santa Fe at a boarding school, they both, they both came from Catholic families that converted very decisively to the Presbyterian Church. Hmm. So um, at Allison James School in Santa Fe, and then at Manal School here in Albuquerque. Yes. Okay. Where is the campus where we lived when I was born, actually. Huh. in 1957 um music and and specifically reading the hymnal was a was a big deal so that's how harmonies i think were introduced to our family from the presbyterian hymnal gotcha. and then yeah. me sitting in church as a little kid you always had a hymnal in front of your face and you're watching these four parts go by um and i could hear my my mom singing uh you know she usually sang more more of a tenor part than an alto part i think I can't really remember, but my dad was was decidedly a tenor part. But then all around us, you could hear people harmonizing and the choir harmonizing. And and so that's why I mean the music comes from both sides, the influence uh, from both sides, but the, yeah. such radically different families. My dad's family was very poor compared to my mom's hmm. uh, family. Dad had 11 kids. My, 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 my mom, her dad died when she was three years old, three months old. Oh wow! And then so there was other another marriage and more brothers and yeah. complicated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this interview is going to air uh, during the holiday season between Thanksgiving and Christmas, and you know that's a time when uh, many of us are uh, either returning uh, in our mind or maybe in you know in person uh, to our families. Mm -hmm. This will be 2021, so uh, in in. 2020, maybe we didn't get to do that. Right. Uh, 2021 is going to be an interesting year to get back together with our yeah. families, those of us who right. weren't able to do that. Yeah. Uh, and you have a Christmas album. Uh, you know, I, I think every professional musician is contracted to, to record <laughs> at least one. Yeah, yeah, that's is, right. Yeah, I'm working okay. on a second one now, actually. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Uh, and we typically think of Christmas as at least in more liturgical settings uh, is associated with Advent, um, that season of anticipation and, and waiting for uh, Christ's birth. And you even have a song uh, that ties together family and Advent, Ruby's Advent song. Yeah. And I, I don't know if that was uh, intended to be a Christmas song. Some people may think it is because it has Advent in the title, but you know, just uh, sort of commonly understood, Advent means a, a notable arrival. Mm. Uh, and I would say uh, what I've seen uh, of you and Ruby, that for you, Ruby was absolutely a notable arrival in your life. Yeah, she was. I mean... Um... We, we we couldn't get pregnant for so long and people were mm -hmm. praying for us and and there were you know there were miscarriages and 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 uh anyway and, yeah. and we were old i was 52 when ruby was born <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah it was it, her arrival was was an answer to so many i mean our prayers mm -hmm. definitely my family's prayers but then prayers from from my my you know, fans of my music that, yeah. that knew about that and, and friends and everything. And, and, and just after a lot of sadness, a lot of, of, um, just like, you know, like I said, there was a failed adoption in there adoption that mm -hmm. we, we actually adopted a little girl and then the mother changed her mind and, and took her back. And, 
So, so grief upon grief. Grief upon grief. And then yeah. and then Ruby, um, she was, when she came, it was a big deal. Yeah. You know? And, and yeah. so the reason I called it Ruby's Advent song is because she was born in Advent, you know. Okay. So it really is then. Yeah. 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 December yeah. 5th. Yeah. Yeah. But but I think of it, you know, yes, as the longing for for Christ to be born, and but now, you know, again now the longing for him to return. Yes, um, you know. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, she's great. I was. Uh, this is funny. This morning I dropped her off at school. She likes to get there very early. Uh, school starts at eight. She wants to be there at seven twenty-five or earlier. So, wow. Okay. I'm not a morning person, but wow, it's it's brutal. But anyway, we got there today, and we always have to drive through the senior parking lot, uh, and there's all these seniors sitting in their cars, uh, talking and smoking, okay. and you know, uh, looking very hip. They're very, they're very, um, I don't know, strange. Bohemian. Buds. Bohemian butt. That's a good word. Yeah. So I drove by today, and you know, I see the same girls in the same jeep every morning. So I just kind of waved and. And they kind of looked up, but they didn't wave back. And, and Ruby said, Dad, seriously, did you just wave at the seniors? Who does that? Oh, my gosh. And so she was so embarrassed that she could hardly wait to get out of the car and go running away, you know. I'm, yeah, I, I tell my kids uh, in the morning, uh, tell everybody I said hi. Yeah. And they all say, no, I'm not going to do it, Dad. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty funny. I'm going to show up, like, next week. I'm going to buy some kind of weird mask and a big pointy hat. I'm going to... When she comes out from school, I'm going to wave, hi, Ruby, and embarrass the heck out of her. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> well, clearly, uh, Art is strong in this one, uh, you know, to borrow from Star Wars. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> she, she has this artistic gene, too. Uh, what, as you look back at your, your heritage, and you're in a place where you're looking forward uh, at what... Uh, is going to be carried forward of your heritage. Yeah. Uh, what do you see growing in Ruby? Well, one thing I can't let go by is is weaving. My family's. I come from a family of weavers. Uh, my grandfather mm. was was a renowned weaver. His weavings. Uh, two of his weavings belong to the Smithsonian Institution and the, the Museum of American History. And the, and they're in the permanent collection, so they come in, in and out of display. I don't know if they're if they're up right now. But they have been in the last five years. Okay. Um, and then his father and his brothers, many of them were weavers um, and very well-known weavers, carrying on this tradition of, of, it's kind of like Navajo design, I would say, geom these geometric figures, which is pretty much all you really can do on a, on a loom, but or on, on the kind of a two-harness loom like they, they did. Okay. So he taught me to weave, my, and my brother. And I have a loom in the back uh, yard here which is oh, also wow. north of here with just a few feet. Uh, but um, that needs to be passed on to Ruby, that mm. one thing. And this morning, very specifically, I said, as we were pulling into the parking lot, right before I ruined the day by waving to the seniors, like, you know, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, what do you see yourself doing, Ruby? Are you, are you mm. thinking music is, is the thing? And she just was emphatic. Absolutely, she said. Mm. So we'll see. We'll yeah. see how, how it goes. Um, I just recorded this song. Uh, it's it, over the last three months. I've been recording a single song. It's taken forever, but a Bob Dylan song called "Dark Eyes." Oh wow! Okay. And so at the end, there was just some little harmony things that I wish were on there, and I just decided to try Ruby out on on the part, and she nailed it, man. I, I mm. her intonation and her sense of rhythm and. And the way she she could match the vowels of of me and the and the uh, the the primary background singer yeah. was remarkable. It's beautiful. So the life of the song is in her. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's why I'm gonna tune her down. I don't want her to steal my thunder. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> she she's got a future ahead of her. She can uh, get the spotlight later, right? Well, yeah. No, that's that's right. And I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm kidding, yeah. but she. There's a, you know, I'm working on this Christmas stuff and I, and I, right away I thought, oh, she's perfect. So, so I'm going to, you know, write out some notes for her and see. Oh, how, that's how fantastic. Goes. Yeah. Yeah. I know, man, as a dad, that, that's gotta be thrilling. Yeah. How many kids do you have? Two. Two kids. Yeah. 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 It is weird to watch them as they start doing these things. You, you know, 
Yeah. I'm kind of blown away. Well, before we go, there's one last thing I want to ask you about. And that's all these pictures of birds that you post on social media. Uh, What are you doing with those these days? Um, So I started taking photos of birds uh, maybe five years ago. Uh, I had a bunch of American Express points and two million actually express points to be used. So I bought some cool stuff, uh, but including a camera and a few lenses and and just started. My sister's a birder. And she's been doing it for for a couple of decades. So she would take me out in the field with her and we'd, we'd you know, shoot birds. And I got addicted. What? Take pictures of birds. No, shooting them with a like, with a shotgun. I'm kidding. OK, yeah, no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. A different kind of Smithsonian collection. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, no. Shooting photos of birds. And, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So I've gotten better and better as I've, as I've gone. I've improved my equi- my equipment quite a bit. Uh, my, my photo gear. I mean, uh, I have a really, really nice Canon camera and, uh, and then a couple of nice lenses. Hmm. And so um, last year, 2020, um, in the, maybe the middle of the year, two friends of mine, Elaine Rubenstein and Shirley Galatly, uh, that were friends in California. Okay. Um, Elaine was my poetry professor, and her husband was, was also a professor of poetry. I took classes from him. And Shirley was in the class for poetry. Um, and um, we just became close friends with the, with the two couples, um, uh, Elaine and her husband Peter and Shirley and her husband Glenn. And they so Elaine and Shirley put like a like a little mock up of what a book of my stories because I write stories to go with the photos and they're usually okay. pretty wacky. Um, and they said, Hey, this is what a book would look like. What do you think? And I was just, yeah, let's do it. So yeah. it took several months and we finally put it together. And then I, I actually have a copy of it here. Um, the book is called Fernando's birds photographs and tales. All right. That's a Stellar's J on the cover with his with a peanut. Um, two, no, it's been three years ago. The, the, these Stellar's J's don't really come down where I live, but for some reason there was like a, some depletion of their food up in the mountains, and this whole valley, North Valley of Albuquerque, was there were hundreds and hundreds of Stellar's J's, mm-hmm. and because I have so many feeders around my house, they were they were coming. Um, I would get twenty, thirty, forty at a time just in the trees around and I, I was buying these big old bags of peanuts for them. And it was, it was crazy. So yeah. anyway, so the, so the book came together and, and, uh, it's, it's very beautiful. Yeah. Well, I would say that, uh, there's at least two reasons, uh, to have the book. One is the, the f- photography is fantastic. Oh, uh, you are at, at least as good a photographer as you are, uh, a musician. Oh, wow. And, Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and if you're not into birds or photography, then it, you got to get the book for the stories. Um, they're just... <laughs> the stories are kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would say if you need something that is um, lighthearted and will bring some joy and laughter, uh, you need Fernando's birds. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks. I, I Somebody said... Uh, said the other day, uh, wrote a comment and said, you're, you're, the stories are so profound and, and rich, and they're definitely not that. They're like, we, I thought, well, that means you just didn't read the book. And out of <laughs> the, the, the stories are meant to be just sort of funny because, uh, you know, and, and I, I think they're pretty funny. I have a blast. Yeah. Some of them are complete fiction, but I make them sound like they're like they actually happened. Right, right. But you know, there's one about an old lady getting carried off by a Cooper sock and her dentures falling out in the neighbor's yard and everything. And and somebody wrote on the, when I posted that on Instagram, they said, "I hope that really didn't happen." So you know, I said, well, yeah, yeah, well, a Cooper sock is too small to carry off a lady in her dentures, but <laughs> depends on the size of the lady, I suppose. Yeah, and the dentures too, because yeah. these were yeah. large dentures. Right, right. <laughs> Well, uh, Fernando, oh, I was going to say. Before, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just that the, the book is available on my website, which is FernandoOrtega.com. There you go. Yeah, and yeah. all my music is there as well. Okay. And we'll have that link in the uh, podcast information also. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> all right. It has been a lot of fun uh, yeah, to be with you. Too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. 
following Jesus is a way of life carried out over a lifetime. If this podcast has encouraged you to become a follower of Jesus or to follow him more closely, we'd love to hear from you. If you enjoyed this podcast or found it helpful, please leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts so others can find it more easily. Thank you for being with us today. On the Way is produced by The Baptist Standard, a donor-supported provider of news, opinion, and resources for living like Jesus. To make a donation, visit baptiststandard.com forward slash donate. To receive the Baptist Standard weekly newsletter, visit baptiststandard.com and click or tap subscribe. 